Hey, and welcome to the State of Tech podcast, recorded November 5th, 2011, and this episode we're going to be discussing tablets. I'm Sean Beavers, and if this is your first time tuning into the State of Tech podcast, and hopefully it's not, um, this is a bi-weekly podcast covering technology in and around the state of Ohio, so we talk about upcoming training opportunities, conferences, best practices in educational technology, and also our awesome thing of the week. And as always, I'm joined by Eric Kurtz and Eric Griffith. How's it going, guys? Hey, uh, going real well here. Uh, since this is a um, tablet uh, episode, uh, I was going to actually start with a real quick uh, tablet story from this week. Uh, I got to go to the ITSCO conference, uh, the Learning in the Cloud uh, conference that we had earlier this week. It was a really cool conference. Um, the folks who attended paid a little bit of extra money, and uh, they were able to get uh, an iPad 2 or an ASUS transformer as part of attending. Now. I was speaking instead of uh, attending, so I didn't get one, you know, but that's fine. That's cool. Uh, what turned out to be really neat was this. I found out that um, my, my wife, through her job, she does like home parties and sells like purses and stuff like that. Uh, her company had an incentive this last month that if you sold so much stuff, you could earn, you know, prizes, and she earned a free iPad too. So in the end, I am ending up getting, in, well, we... <laughs> Not necessarily mine. <laughs> I am. In, we are ending up getting an iPad too, anyway, uh, uh, because my wife is awesome. <laughs> so, well, she's you know, uh, all, I guess she could have been my awesome thing of the week, but uh, I'll go ahead and throw that in there. So, I'm really excited about this episode today because I um, am just now getting into the tablet area because of that. So, uh, good for her, and I'm really excited to uh, see what people share today about uh, the tablets. I'm going to throw this over to Eric G, who's a little under the weather. How you doing, Eric? Uh, not too bad. My voice is not as uh, deep as usual, or maybe it is way too deep. Um, but yeah, it's good news on the tablet front. Uh, it's actually only 50% of your tablet, Eric. I thought I'd just remind you of that, though. So That is, that is correct. <laughs> yes, yes. So you only get half the apps and, and everything else. So No, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's all her tablet. <laughs> actually, I'm pretty sure it's all hers. <laughs> gotcha. Good, yep. So I want to apologize if I appear, uh, or I'm sorry, if I sound uh, awkward over the uh, the mic, or uh, if I squeak or suddenly uh, my voice goes away. Uh, it's due to the uh, sinus infection, or at least that's what I'm calling it. And uh, yeah, hopefully it should go away in the next couple of days here. But back to Sean. And uh, today you are in your own house, I believe, correct? Yes, yes, that is true. Uh, previous episode, uh, did a little uh, B&E and uh, surveilled my, uh, did some surveillance on my neighbors and yeah, there's some nice uh, nice houses with pretty good Wi-Fi around here. So, um, But, nope, this week my Time Warner connection is great. And, uh, yeah, I decided to stay here. All right, awesome. And we have two very special guests. I don't think we've ever used Very in the podcast before, but two very special guests. Brian Poole from National Trail and also Ryan Collins. If you want to just give a shout-out. Hi. That yeah, was I, perfect. <laughs> and I, th <laughs> I think we lost I think we lost Ryan. Uh, so uh, he'll, I'm sure he'll pop back in here, and uh, hopefully between now and when we get into the meat of the matter. So, um, all and right, he'll say hello at some point, so you'll you'll get a chance to hear from him. All right, so we don't have as much news as we normally do. It doesn't seem like there's you know um, not as many conferences or opportunities this week. But Eric C is going to fill you in on what's going on uh, this week in tech. Sure thing. A um, couple of quick news items. Uh, the first one is the um, Atomic Learning uh, website, which provides uh, really nice short videos on all sorts of technology topics, uh, excellent for your teachers, excellent for your students. Um, they've uh, paired up with, uh, with the state of Ohio and through eTech, and eTech is offering some um, free district licenses to Atomic Learning um, and what you need to do is you need to fill out an application for that and I'll pop over to that um, for those who are uh, watching the video you can can see this um, and what they've done is they put together an application online where you can go in and your superintendent does need to be involved in this and you can request um, to um, to apply for these Atomic Learning licenses and the way I understand it is as long as you fill it out 
until they're all allocated, you'll get them. And so, I mean, just it's like excellent free professional development. Uh, these great videos, they cover Microsoft Office, they cover Google Apps, they cover all sorts of technology issues. Just a great way to bring in some more PD opportunities for your staff and students. So definitely go there. Um, the link, the easiest way to get to that, uh, if you just pop into our show notes and take a look, you'll see a link right to that survey that needs to get filled out. It did open November 3rd. They're going to keep it open until November 25th or until the remaining licenses are, are allocated out. So definitely jump on that. Uh, speak to your superintendent to get um, assistance with getting that filled out. Um, the next piece of news is just that there is a conference coming up uh, very quickly here, November 13th through 16th. In Columbus is the Ohio uh, School School Boards Association Conference, and so the uh, the Capital Conference. So just want to let people know that that is coming up. And then the uh, final piece of news is just that um, the uh, folks at ETech um, are asking uh, for folks if they would like to volunteer at the uh, ETech conference coming up to please do so, or still register if you have not. The link is um, live and active on the uh, ETech site. And that really is all of the news we have for today. All right, great. So the next uh, thing we're going to be talking about is our awesome thing of the week. And I had a really hard time trying to narrow down mine. And uh, I narrowed it down to actually 1,300 things, which uh, <laughs> was pretty easy. Uh, so my awesome thing of the week is this website that I just came across actually this morning. And it's called Appetic, I believe. And it's put together by some Apple Distinguished Educators. And they have around 1,300 uh, different iOS apps for education. And they're broken down. We have uh, preschool themes, so art, music, math, German, language, arts, science, multiple intelligences, and also Bloom's Taxonomy. So it seems like a really great website, real, you know, really well put together, and uh, I'm definitely going to be uh, checking that out and trying to find some good app ideas for some of the classes I do at SOIDA. Uh, how about uh, Eric C., what do you have for us this week? Yeah, sure. Um my uh, awesome things of the week actually did too, so I'm sorry if I wasn't allowed to do that. Uh, but uh, it, they both deal with PDFs. Um, one of them is converting things to PDF, and the other is converting things from PDF back into something else. Um, I think PDFs are you know widely accepted as one of the best ways to share information uh, between folks regardless of whether you've got a Mac or a PC or what kind of device you're using. And we certainly use PDFs a lot on our website. Uh, it's just a, a way to be sure that folks are going to be able to read the information you're trying to put out there. Um, now this is a tool I use and I know there's loads and loads and loads of these out there. This one uh, though I'm comfortable with and I'm familiar with, I use it a lot so I can speak for it, can't necessarily speak for some of the other ones out there. This is a Windows based one. I'm sure, absolutely sure there, there's Mac options for these sort of things as well, but it's called Cute PDF. And basically what it is, it's a free program, totally free, and that's what's nice about it. It's for personal, commercial, government education use. There are no strings attached. There's no ads that pop up. There's no watermarks. There's nothing like that at all. It's just you install the program. So that's good to begin with. So really easy. It's free. Install it. Now, what's great about it is how it works. Now, this isn't necessarily specific to this program. I'm sure other programs do it the same way. But the way QPDF works is it installs a pretend printer um, onto your system and the printer is called Cute PDF Writer and so anytime you go to print any kind of document it doesn't matter if you're in you know like Microsoft Office it doesn't matter if you're trying to print a web page doesn't matter if you're in some crazy old little kids program like uh, you know student writing center or something from 15 years ago if it has a print dialogue if you can go file print you can then pick out cute PDF as the pretend printer and what it does instead of really printing anything is it saves that uh, that print job into a PDF file for you so it's just so easy to use we throw this on all of our computers in our district so that anytime the staff need to put something on their web page or share something that they want to make sure everybody can get to and can access then they definitely can do this uh, with cute PDF writer so that's a good one to recommend for going the direction of into a PDF I just wanted to throw out real quickly though you can go the other direction and you can go from a PDF and there's again lots and lots and lots of ways to do this I'm just going to mention briefly that Google Docs can help you with this so if you have a Gmail account or a Google Apps account one of the really cool things about it is if I go in to upload um, a file and you'll see that I've got the settings option here there is an option where I can tell it to convert 
text from uploaded PDF and image files. So if I have a PDF or even just a scanned, you know, if I have a scanner uh, or if our copiers do scanning, if I put a, a document down there and scan it as an image, either way, a PDF or an image, I can tell Google Docs to do OCR, optical character recognition on that and convert it from a PDF or an image back into text. So if I go ahead, I'll just try one real quick here. Let's go ahead and grab one of my little, uh, there we go. And uh, go ahead and start the upload here. I'm just grabbing one of my little help guides on how to use our Pinnacle Internet Viewer uh, program for our for our families. So I'll go ahead and just uh, send that on up there. And basically, what it's going to do is it's going to upload the file, and then it's going to convert it. That was fast. I mean, it's done. It's uploaded and it's converted. So now, if I go ahead and go in and open up this. Um, uploaded PDF, what I'm going to see is it's been turned into a Google Doc and it's a little confusing at first. What you see is the first page is going to be actually the um, scanned uh, image of that first PDF page, but if I go down below that, I then see the actual editable text. So it has taken that PDF and it's pulled out all of the text that was in there for page one. Scroll down past that, now here's page two. And so I can see the original PDF, what it looked like, in case maybe something didn't convert over properly. I can compare it and see what it was supposed to say. But it does a really nice job. And so here's the second page converted, and there's the third page, and there's the third page converted. So you can go in, of course, and you can delete out the original uh, images that it brought in and be left with just the editable text. And now you can go ahead and you know do whatever you need to update that, modify that, however you need. So just some real quick, nice ideas for how you can turn things into PDFs and then take things uh, from PDF back into an editable form. And uh, I'll throw this over to Eric G now. Great. Well, thanks, Eric. Uh, I eliminated the whole PDF issue at my school by just teaching everyone binary. So we just have no more PDF issues. But uh, so, but uh, my awesome thing of the week actually is um, is an iPad app. It's a, it's an app for just about every device out there, and it's um, it is a little costly though, depending on the device that you use. I'm going to share my screen here uh, real quick. It's called Quick Office. Perhaps some of you uh, use it, but Quick Office, um, it's, it's like a, a document editor for just about any device. Um, I clicked on the volume licensing here. Let me click back here. But it shows, you know, it tells you it works on just about any device. It'll do presentations, uh, documents, um, PDFs, different things like that. But my favorite thing about it is it actually does uh, work. Or it does connect to Dropbox, Google Docs and uh, a variety of other um, applications or, or uh, online file storage applications like uh, SugarSync, I think, is another one. So, but it's, I've, I've tried, you know, three or four other, um, you know, apps that, that do the very same thing. And uh, this one crashes the least. Um, so it's, it's my favorite thing of the week. And uh, it's something I typically take notes in. Sean, you have a question? Yeah, I had a question about that. Does that... You know, if you are able, you said you're able to pull things down from Google Docs. If you change anything, can you upload it back to Google Docs? Absolutely. You can upload it or you can work on it right there um, from those devices. I, I don't know if you can work on it right there in Google Docs. I know you can do it, work on it uh, in Dropbox. But uh, if anybody else has used it, feel free to chime in. Um, it's one of my my favorite apps. It's, it's something I typically don't take notes in unless I'm connected. Um, I typically use, you know, the... All, at least on my iPad, just the, the regular editor. But, uh, yeah. It's my and you like that better than Pages? Uh, I do. Uh, pages was, uh, you know, wasn't there first. Um, and for me, for Pages, you had to spend a little bit of money to get, you know, to get it out or make it sync with Dropbox. And um, this does it for free. Well, this does it, does it all for less, I guess I should say. So, yep. all right. Great. Well, let's jump right into our main topic today, which is tablets, and hear a little bit more from our special guest today. Uh, Brian, if you want to go ahead and talk a little bit about yourself and your district. Okay. Um, my name is Brian Poole. Is my audio working? Because I don't see myself switching up there. Yep. Okay. Um, I'm the technology coordinator for National Trail Local Schools, which is a um, small K-12 complex, about 1,200 students all together. And um, we this year did a Android um, project with a 7-inch uh, capacitive screen um, Android tablet. We also looked at the iPad 
Uh, and we looked at uh, another Android tablet. We actually tested about three or four in the process. Uh, this is a test that we bought about a 40 of them. And um, instead of um, buying social studies textbooks this year, the social studies teacher opted to use his textbook funds to set up an Android tablet lab for his room. And that's what kind of got us started into it. All right, great. And also, uh, Ryan Collins is supposed to be with us, but he keeps cutting in and out, so hopefully you'll get a chance to hear from him and, and uh, his district as well. So, you know, one of the first things I think it's important to talk about is why did you decide to go with tablets versus maybe netbooks or laptops? Why was that a good choice uh, for what you're doing in uh, National Trail? Well, we do have um, netbooks, and I'm a netbook fan over laptops, mainly because of the laptop uh, battery issue. We had... Um, three laptop carts uh, at one point were down to two of them just because the batteries don't last. Um, if a teacher uses them first block, now they've got to charge them second block, and then they can use them third block. And Whereas uh, with the netbook, we're able to use them all day long. We've got um, three of the nice Dell netbook carts, uh, as well as some Samsung netbooks and a couple uh, SUS netbooks. Um, but we have used the netbooks, and, and it's not that we don't like them. Uh, it's just that we were looking for something else to use, and eventually our, our end goal is to possibly um, have these in every single student's hand uh, and be a paper textbook replacement. So that's one of the things we wanted to see, the, the viability and the durability of them. Uh, over, we, we know that we can't replay, give every student in our district, we're not a wealthy school district, and we can't and we're not a poor enough school district, so you're two in the middle there to get the, the funds that, that you need to do a one-to-one, -one, in my opinion. So we had to look for something that, that would be an equitable solution that the district could afford as well as the students being able to afford, because our, our idea is if we do go to this, that the, the district will pay a, a portion and the students will pay a portion. It will be their item to maintain and to keep forever. Um, this, these are set up, I made a, a cabinet that they get left in every night and they charge every night, but they last all day long on the, on the single charge. Um, at least we've never had one, uh, a battery be an issue uh, for them yet, because they do get put back in the, in the spot over lunch uh, and sometimes over intervention, but um, they've lasted long enough that the, the battery issue has not been a factor. But really the big thing was we wanted something that was completely portable affordable, which I'm an iPad fan, I love the iPad, but affordability, you know, it's the same as a netbook. In fact, you can get netbooks cheaper than iPads. Um, so that's not, that's where it kind of fell out there. So that, that's why we went that direction. And like I said, we, we tried both a 10-inch, uh, which is a resistive uh, tablet, um, and for the same price point, you can get a capacitive uh, tablet instead. And we found that both the size was acceptable on the 7-inch and the response and usability of the capacitive, which is the same thing in an iPad and iTouch is, was far enough superior to the resistive screen that we were willing to give up the screen size for the, for the better response and, and, uh, and image quality and stuff as well. And that's something that Eric uh, G and I have talked about. Not, I don't want to say heatedly, but you know, what is the perfect screen size? You know, he thinks seven inches, and I think you know, Brian, you and I talked about that. It's easy to put in your pocket; you can take it with you. Versus that ten-inch tablet, it's kind of a little bit unwieldy. I, I, I think eight inches. I'm an eight. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if, if I had that option, because the seven inch is nice. You know, um, I don't know how well you can see this one, but this is running Android 2.3. And um, it's got, I'm trying to get the glare out of there. I don't know if there's a point where I can do that. But uh, it's got, um, on here we're running Kindle. We've got Firefox browser as well as a native browser. Uh, it's got a um, really nice TI-83 emulator app, which our idea with that would be that all of our students would save $80 on buying a TI-83. And really they'd still spend $80 because what we envision happening is that we add a $25 a year fee onto all the students. They pay $100 for this device, which is no more than they're spending anyway. Um, and instead, they end up keeping this when they leave. Uh, so it, it's got some nice things to it that we really found a way to, to say it's as equitable for a student if they spend $100 in fees and keep this versus paying 
$20 in fees through their four years for their um, planners and another $80 for their own TI-83. It's a wash for them. They keep this. If the district spends the other $50, because these are about $150 with shipping a piece, then uh, conceivably that's $5,000 a year we spend, but we're spending $25,000 a year in the high school on textbooks. Uh, yes, we'd have to buy some electronic, but then we don't replace them the same because many times uh, we're buying textbooks just to replace them because they're worn out, not because American history has changed. Uh, and so there are a lot of classes that you would never really have to buy a new one, or at least you wouldn't have to be on a five-year rotation to do it. So, All right, great. Ryan, are you back with us? Well, I, yeah, I'm here. <laughs> Sorry about that. I don't know what was going on. Well, um, do you want to just maybe talk a little bit about yourself and what you do and um, your, uh, where you kind of are with tablets or where your district is with tablets? I'm Ryan Collins. I'm the technology coordinator with Kenton City Schools. And we, our middle school, received an ARRA grant two years ago. And so as part of the grant, they, the grant team chose to go with we have iPod Touches, we have iPads, and we have laptops. Um, and so we're just kind of muddling our way through this. There's, I'm assuming we missed out on all the, I missed out on all the pros and cons of going with the format. <laughs> but um, why we went with the iPad and the i, I bought an iPad when they were released. I was up for a new laptop, and I was hoping that my iPad would replace my laptop. At the time, no. I ended up, the MacBook Air came out and I bought an Air. But it, the software just wasn't there. Nowadays, I could do a lot more with it. I still, I had to transcode an audio file this morning. I can't do that with the iPad. But once you have it, if you've never used a tablet computer before, even the big old Windows ones with the stylus, those don't, the lightweight of the iPad, you know, when you're getting ready to leave the house and you're like, should I take a computer or not? When you have the iPad, it's a no-brainer. You just grab it. It's so light. And the portability factor, when I'm in walking around with this, I can walk around with this and use it, and I can also bring something up and then just hand it to a person and say, here, look at this. And they can look at the document or whatever I'm trying to show them. So the form factor is very, very nice. Um, other things, are we, well, I, I, I don't want to get ahead of myself, so, but that's what we've got. It. We've been muddling our way through on what we want to do with it. It was kind of putting the cart before the horse. They got the money. They weren't, it was a grant. They didn't know they were going to get the money, so we started buying things without really planning out everything. It's worked out pretty well so far. The students have no problems with it. Uh, the thing I've noticed is the older people, I can't get them to believe that an iPod Touch, this is my iPhone, but it's the same size as an iPod Touch. The older staff, I can't get them to believe that students can be productive on a smaller device. They can't, they can't see that, ah, even though the resolution of this is only 100 pixels less across than the iPad, they can't see that oh, my students can be productive on this. So we're right now we're looking at, I'm hoping we're going to do a one-to-one -one with iPod Touches at our seventh grade level. We got another grant, and that's what I'm pushing. I'm really pushing that hard. I don't know if we'll do that or not. Well, and I guess uh, one of the questions we had, and, I, and again, I don't want to turn this into an Apple fanboy versus uh, no. Android <laughs> fanboy argument, but, you know, what are the, I guess, Brian, you, you picked an Android tablet, you know, seven inches. I know you said cost was one of those factors. Do you feel there's any other strengths of Android? I mean, looking in the marketplace or how it ties into Google services or anything else that drew you to that tablet versus the iPad? Well, I, I'll tell you, it was, it's very, very easy to, to rebuild, which is one of the things. I mean, um, all I have to do is uh, put an SD card in there and I can reflash it with whatever, um, like it came with 2.1, I upgraded to 2.2 and now it's on, running 2.3. Uh, it also has, obviously in the same spot, I can put a 16 gig memory card in there. The device itself, um, 
opens up actually pretty easily, especially if you have a heat gun, which I would recommend, uh, because basically the back panel is just double-sided taped over the screw spot on, on the back, and it's just running off a of 4-gig, um, you know, mini SD card. So if I had uh, an 8-gigger or a 16-gigger I wanted to throw in there, I could turn this into 16 gig of storage. Now, we're not doing that. We're not doing that because there's nothing really we want the students to store on at this, at this point. Uh, but if we went to the point where it was a one-to-one -one and all the textbooks or PDFs or Kindle books that we've got on, on the device, we may want to increase the storage. And it's, you know, it's the cost of the card is all the difference um, to do that. Or, you know, we could just give the kids each their own four gig card and, and put them in there as well. Um, it's fairly easy to use. Uh, the advantage of it over, and, and you know, I, it's not like I'm not a um, fan of the uh, Apple devices. It's just the advantage of it is that um, the, the cost, really. The apps are great. I, mainly, we're just using it as a web browser. Uh, I'll, I'll be honest, the, the um, Native browser on there does 90% of the work that the students are using it for at this point. Um, because we're a Moodle district, all of our um, classes and information are in Moodle, and a large number of the documents are just shared right through Moodle. Um, if we put up videos in our Moodle course, we just make them a flash video, and they play right, great right through here, um, And which was what we found that we needed to do in order to get the videos to play well on it. Um, Although we have the Kindle app on there, we have not used any Kindle stuff because the social studies teacher who's using the device has found a all online open source textbook that they're using, which was originally developed through the California Open Source Textbook Initiative, that he's using that as his textbook and supplementing it with his Moodle class as well. Um, also, one of the things they're using a lot, which Ryan may want to use to try to convince his district the viability of the iTouch is if you don't have turning point systems for, um, for uh, student response systems, it integrates so well. And we got, because we had the rep come to the school, we got a free um, one year of turning point, their web feature, and it is seamless. We already had a turning point clicker set in that classroom. Now it's moved to another room or it's going to be redistributed to another room. Because now when he uses turning point stuff, the question comes up on here, the uh, oops, I just opened something up. The question comes up on there. The the uh, answers come up on there. Everything comes up right on there as, as the class is using it, and it's been much nicer than just the clickers because now we can use extended students response question if he wants to. Um, it's much nicer. And Ryan, if they've already got it, then uh, there is a cost per year for the turning point thing, but we found that our turning point clicker sets only last about five years. The buttons start to fall off. Um, I don't know if anybody's had that issue, although Turning Point was great and replaced a bunch of them for us just recently. Um, but uh, with that, you, you have to pay, I think it was $10 per student, uh, I'm sorry, per active account per year. So if you only think 60 kids are going to use it at a time, you only have to buy 60. Even though every student will be able to use it, it's how many con concurrent users can use it. So it's not really that expensive when you look at a set of clickers versus now every teacher in every classroom could use student response. We just monitor, have to monitor how many are going to use it concurrently and how many licenses. So that's one really nice thing, and that's with any of these devices that you could use. It works with just through the web browser, although there is an app for the uh, the um, iDevices to do it as well, but it works yeah, just have, fine through the browser. Have you looked at um, Poll Anywhere then? We have also um, the the difference between poll anywhere is it does at least we haven't found and maybe we're not using it as well as other people are. It, it's a one thing go to this one thing go to this as opposed to integrate it right in with your PowerPoint presentation like the teachers are already doing. Yeah. Well, uh, see, the turning point anywhere doesn't we're all Max, so oh, it, wow. it throws wow. this <laughs> turning point anywhere thing overlays whatever presentation you're using. So it's oh, not it integrated. So it, yeah, it's not integrated with PowerPoint at all. Oh, so okay. that's why it doesn't. We're not. You, I mean, we're not slaves to Turning Point if we don't want to be. Okay. Because they give us no love. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're all PC districts, so that that obviously uh, makes a difference. So, but as far as what we we found, um, 
you know, and really we, we looked at the Kindle as well. I'll be honest there. We have a, we have a whole set of Kindles that we use for reading uh, in the 6th and 8th grade, which really the 6th grade teacher is mainly using now as, as her way of doing all of her reading classes. And we looked at that, but it, it became a, a color issue. Uh, because our science teacher said, I, I can't have a black and white textbook. There's no way for them to know which thing is which. So we had to go color uh, was our decision there. And if we have to go color, then what can we afford? Because obviously the Kindle now is only $79. It would be great if, if that was an option. And, and honestly, we've pre-ordered a Kindle Fire to evaluate that as well because at the price point of a, of a Kindle Fire coming in at 199 you know, we saw the Kindle come in at 400 and what, 99 or 439 and 79 now. So I'm hoping that the Kindle Fire within implementation time may, may even be down to 149, which is really the price point we're looking for is around $150. Uh, the problem with the Kindle Fire is no microphone, no camera. I, I want to look at it, but I'm not too sold on it yet. I'm just, I don't like those two limitations. Right, and I'll be honest, this has a camera on it uh, and a microphone on it. They have never used the camera. Yeah. Uh, the microphone, which to me would be a really nice thing to be able to audio record classes like I do with SoundNote on my um, iPad. I use that in every single meeting that I go to to take notes and record the audio. Um, so not having a mic um, is kind of an issue to me, although I... I have an iPad 1, I have no camera on that, and I've never missed having a camera on that. But um, you do have a mic. But I do have a mic, and that's <laughs> the thing. And, and, so, and I use that regularly for a lot of things. So um, actually, I didn't know the Kindle Fire didn't have a mic. I knew it didn't have a camera. Yeah. So we'll see what, you know, how that evolves as well. And, and the, back, the iPad, the, th the phrase I hear online is, there's not a tablet market, there's an iPad market. All these other people are trying to put out an Android tablet, which I hope they succeed because it'll make everybody better if Apple has some sort of competition. But it's the quality of the apps. There's nothing like GarageBand, and they just released GarageBand that will run on your iPod Touch and the iPhone. There's nothing like GarageBand that will run on any other portable device like this. And for those that are not familiar with GarageBand, it's Apple's multi-track audio editing software. And it's got smart instruments, so you can actually play guitar. I should have grabbed my cable so we could do a little demo. Um, but it's amazing what you can do with it. And there's the iMovie. And that's the difference. We, we're looking at using a lot of the apps because right now that's where all the apps are. No one's making, I shouldn't say no one, the apps for the educational market for Android are pretty few and far between. Not saying that there's none out there, but there's not as any like, where is it? Brian, you talk while I find it. <laughs> okay, well, I, I will say that, that I understand what you're saying on that, but what we found is for the for 90% of the teachers, Android does have what we need. And, and we've got um, uh, Android tablets now, the same one down in the elementary school being used with uh, with our uh, intervention teachers as well as a teacher has one for an autistic student to be able to do uh, things with Android tablet. And I do know what you're talking about. There are some great apps on the iPad, but to a large extent, the ones that we need exist on Android as well. Yeah. Um, and and I, I'm not, I wouldn't lie to anyone and say that all the apps on iPad are on Android because they're not. Um, but what we need generally is. And at the price point, if we had it, the, the grant, Ryan, I, I'll tell you, we would have done the same thing. We would have yeah. gone out and gotten an iPad well, and um, that's for why, every student. And that's why I'm looking at the iPod Touches because they're 200 bucks. That's something that we can, we can support that after the grant's over with. We can afford to push. Well, just like the same price you're paying for your Android tablets. And I guess the thing, and I've got an iPod Touch as well. The thing is with a classroom thing, I would say that they can type a paper, because Google Docs work for, obviously works really well through the Android browser. Um, they can still type a paper on here. Um, still haven't found a way to get to PowerPoint presentations, but the 7-inch screen is still usable enough so that when I go in, and obviously this has Zoom, just like, I don't know if you can see that or not. <laughs> I'm going off screen, but it zooms just like an, like an iPad does. It's very responsive. When I go into the classes, if I wanted, if I had something that I wanted to do, 
a, a, uh, a paper or something on Moodle, that works pretty well. I would say an iTouch, although it has a lot of, I'm not saying there's no implementation things, for a high school student, it's going to be limiting the kind of items that we would be able well, to do on that small of a screen. And that's why we're looking at, um, have you looked at, I don't know what the Android version of Quick Office looks like. Um, Quick Office on iOS devices connects right to Google Docs. So they can bring up, let me bring it up here. And I'll pull it really close so you can see it. There, look at that, Quick Office Pro. Quick Office Pro will show me here as soon as it, fires up. There it is. I can connect right to, it's in backwards so it's hard for me to see it. Second one down here is my Kenton City Schools Google Apps account. Now it's going to go out and connect to Google Apps. There it is, Collins Art, Kenton City Schools. I'll get a bunch of spam now. But it'll go out and let me find an item that I can open for you guys. Uh, this is really hard to do. There, now it's going to download that document right to the device, and then there's the nice little, it was a spreadsheet I downloaded. So I can work on it right on the device without having to try to use the web interface. And this works with presentations, word processing, and spreadsheets. So that might be something, look, I don't know what QuickOffice can do on the Android, but that might be a good solution. And that's why the big difference reason why we're looking at Quick Office Pro is they can easily log their account out. Because if you're using these in shared environments, you don't want somebody just to be able to log into your Google Docs account. But they can then add in their own and connect to their docs and work on it without having to go through the web interface. Because a web interface pretty much, especially word processing, is not fun. Eric C? And guys... Yeah, if I can jump in real quick there. A um, couple of quick questions. Uh, I think we're going to probably turn the conversation just a bit more toward the implementation here in a bit because, you know, certainly we can talk all day about Apple and Android. I mean, I'm, more, I'm, 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 an, I'm, I'm more of an Android guy, but I'm getting the, you know, iPad 2 that my wife earned, and that's fantastic. I know I'm going to love that. So as we start to, you know, take that turn here in just a bit, I, I did want to throw one thing out because I missed something, and, and if I missed it, I'm afraid maybe some of our, our listeners might have missed it as well. Brian, when you were talking about the device that you have there, and I apologize, you know, you probably said it, and it just slipped by me. Can, can you can you remind us again what is that? I, mean, I know you're running an Android on it, but what is that make and model of that device, and where did you get that? Because you know, an Android tablet at $150, doing what you're saying, um, I, I have not been able to find that. So I, I'll go ahead and yeah, I'll, I'll let you explain that to us again. I'm sorry, I missed that. Okay, I, I actually didn't explain it. So I brought up the screen where we bought them. Um, we bought, and, and we've tried this site, and I would. If you've never used AliExpress, I would tell you that there are thousands of sellers, and you need to beware and make sure you're looking. It's kind of like buying on eBay. Uh, we bought these direct from China, and you can see our price that we paid when we bought. Uh, we bought over 30, so we paid $135.99 per. Um, this device, it's got 512 mega RAM, uh, a 4 um, gigabyte um, card inside it, and you can get it with a bigger card, and you can get it with a keyboard case, which um, I'm going to tell you I think is junk. I wouldn't recommend it. Um, but it kind of like is a cover that comes with it. We got one of them and decided we were not going that way. Um, and so you can see what how much this one costs. And basically, AliExpress is a site that you buy direct from China. And the um, this particular seller, I tried, I'll, I'll be honest, we bought one from four different sellers. Um, actually probably six uh, but you get the we got the bait and switch thing where you know we ordered one and said oh that's not available at that price really it's hundred and fifty dollars and we said no thanks and then uh, that happened to us a couple times before we found the seller that we ended up going with um, and we got one from him the packaging was wonderful that we got it within a week um, and the ones that we've had problems with two of them. He said, send them back. I will repair or replace them and mail them right back to you. And I'll tell you, you don't want to do that onesie at a time because shipping to China is not inexpensive. Um, 
But, and, and, and things that I've had problems with, he walked me through via email, hey, here's a new flash, because we had some that had wireless problems here, flash it with this, and see if that solves the problem, and it did. Um, so this is the site, aliexpress.com. There's also the other site attached to this is Alibaba, which is for distributors. Um, and when you buy the item, you can pay for different versions of shipping. A lot of times on this website, the shipping is free through China Air. And if you look at it, it says China Air can take as many as 43 days. And it does. So I would recommend not doing that. We've either use DHL, FedEx, or EMS as our shipping, and they've all, all gotten to us within a week. Um, the big thing with this site is, is really paying attention to whether it's a resistive or capacitive screen, because a lot of times you look and it sounds like the exact same one. Uh, in fact, one of the ones we got from one of the distributors had this exact same heading that it was capacitive screen, and in fact, we were looking for this processor uh, because that is the Samsung Galaxy Tab processor. This is the uh, initial Samsung Galaxy Tab innards exactly. Um, and that's why when I tested it, it was really, really responsive. I mean, it's as fast as the iPad was as far as opening things because our, our, our other one that we tried, which is this um, one up here, the, the uh, ZenoThink ZT180 is the other one we tried at a 10 inch. Um, the response is definitely slower. Now, I'll tell you that they have a newer one out that's, that's got more memory, because ours came with 256 mega RAM, and this had 512, so that obviously makes a difference. Press the processor was faster. So AliExpress is where we bought a number of things. Um, and just like eBay, you need to check how many things that they've sold, what their ratings are, um, that kind of stuff on a particular seller to see what kind of feedback he's got. Um, but this is where we got it. and and. After, you know, we got some, one that, like I said, we, it said it was capacitive screen. We got it. It was resistive. Um, it was just as responsive, but the resistive screen, you know, if you don't know a resistive screen, it's got a, basically a plastic film over the glass, not what we want to be handing out to students. I don't think that will uh, maintain as well uh, as the capacitive glass screen, just like an iPad and an iPod Touch. Uh, we have had one broken by a student who dropped it from a, apparent height uh, that landed just wrong. But we've also repaired a couple of these ourselves because they opened up pretty easily. And, and it was, you know, I had one that had no Wi-Fi connection. I opened it up and the Wi-Fi was, antenna was disconnected, resoldered it, closed it up, and there you go. Um, and we had a couple of the flash cards go bad. Um, and I just swapped them out and the device works great again. So. So this is where we bought them, and this is the price point that we bought them at. And I'll, I'll show you, if you go to view current product, the same distributor doesn't have them right now. But then a week from now, he will, because we bought that's what we bought the one, and then he ran out, and then all of a sudden he's got them again. Um, and I'll be honest, I've stu stuck with this guy for the last couple purchases because he sent me what I ordered. Um, and I did not necessarily get that with the other people. And he's got, I mean, I'm not trying to push him because there, obviously there are thousands of, of stores through AliExpress um, with China Direct products. And, I mean, he's got his own store just like uh, an eBay store, and you can go through there. By the way, that's what the keyboard looks like. Um, the problem with the, the one with the keyboard is the plug is not the same size on the device as the keyboard, so then it requires this big, huge honking adapter to go from USB to mini USB, and it won't close up anymore. And just kind of, we bought this um, this cover instead. Oh, I'm holding up the wrong one. We bought this cover instead because it's basically, if you look at it, it's a it's a faux leather cover that closes up, and the students um, just put it away like this and plug the uh, power in. This cover also is real, and their cover was only five bucks, by the way, through the same website different distributor. But it, it folds back like that, and now they can set it on their desk and use it um, if they're watching video. And we bought a whole bunch of $2 headsets through the same website um, so that every kid has their own headset that they just keep. We just put that on their student fees. So it made it really nice. And by the way, Ryan, I'm trying out your uh, Quick Office Pro trial right now, if you can see that on there. There we go. All right, so let's uh, talk a little bit about implementation and how you rolled this out. You know, did you have any kind of pilot program before you 
I think you, you're just using these right now. 30 of them with a history class, Brian, or Ryan with your AR, AAA -A -A grant. Um, <laughs> you know, what did that look like? How did, did you try them out with teachers, staff, students first? What did you do? It, well, before, Brian, I accidentally had my mic muted. Brian, how did you pay for those devices? Uh, actually, um, Alibaba used to let you pay through PayPal. So we used PayPal through our school credit card to pay for it uh, because I kind of wanted the double protection with that big of an order that I could cancel it with my credit card or with PayPal. Um, they don't take PayPal anymore. And so our, we do have a school credit card that we used um, for the second order because we ordered another set of them after that. Um, and that's, that's how we paid for it. You can buy them even way cheaper through um, Alibaba if you're willing to pay up front I mean, the, the price goes way down. If you if we were to do uh, four or five hundred to buy them all at one time, that might be a way to go. It's just it makes me really nervous. Um, <laughs> I, you know, the the great thing, and I will tell you about this about AliExpress. If you've never used them before, um, you pay, and it goes into an escrow account. They send you the item. They do not get paid until you go online and say, "I have got the item. It's what I ordered." pay them. Uh, if you don't, and, and basically it goes to, it tracks it, and if you've gotten it and you haven't responded within five days, they do get paid. So you have to say within five days, this is five days of receiving the item, this is what I ordered or this is not what I ordered, it, which is what happened with the one resistive tablet, and Alibaba didn't pay him. Um, I had to mail it back to him, and then I just got my money back. They got nothing out of the, out of the item. So it, there is protection with that website, um, which is why I didn't feel too bad about doing it. They, they do not pay the distributor until you've said you got it and it's good. That's pretty cool. So, okay, implementation. We um, I'll just start because Brian's probably tired of talking. <laughs> um, we uh, for, we sent the teachers to a ton of in-services, and we had people come in to get the teachers on board so they knew what they could use them for and how they could use them in their classroom, and that's worked out pretty well. Um, a lot of our teachers, it's actually gotten better in the last year or so, but when we first started implementing them last year, a lot of our teachers didn't have smartphones. I'm surprised in the last year how many of our teachers now have smartphones, which gets them over that learning curve a little bit. They're kind of used to dealing with apps or used to using their... Um, sorry, I'm getting Buckeye scores. Um, they're used to working with apps and they're working with the touch interfaces. And what about, what are you using to manage these? Are you just plugging them into iTunes one by one or how are you imaging them, I guess, so to speak? We do it the old-fashioned way. We have one shared account and if a teacher wants an app installed on it, we'll buy it for that account. And then I tell them, just have the students install it. Give them that password. They can't, the account has no method of payment, so the only thing the kids can do with that is download free apps if they wanted to. And then we can just go in and change that password every so often. So that way, we, it kind of bypasses the whole syncing issue. We don't have to worry about um, trying to plug them into one machine because the syncing base stations are outrageously priced. Now... With the newest version, iOS 5, they have the Wi-Fi syncing, so I'm going to try see how well that works because I'd love to be able to just tell the student, just sync your device when you're at school, and it'll have the apps on it installed. So you don't have it restricted then on those devices that they can't use the App Store, correct? No. So that they can go in and download the free ones. Yeah, they can. And the students will use their own account. They've figured out how they can sign up the school account, and they'll sign in with their account, and they can download their apps they've paid for if they know that only works though is because Apple when you sign in on a new device Apple if it there's a credit card attached to it Apple will say what's the security code on that credit card before they'll let you put that account on there a lot of the students though don't have a credit card attached they use their iTunes gift cards so it doesn't do that. And so you haven't run into any issues where they've downloaded something inappropriate, or did you talk to them prior and say, you know, these are the kinds of things that we would like on these devices, you know, here are the things that... We haven't really had that issue yet. I, the App Store, there's a lot, I mean, there's inappropriate stuff on there, but it's not like free reign like the Internet is. And there are, since they're checking the devices out, 
it's not as big a deal. If it was one to one, I foresee we'll have to have those discussions. We're going to have to have those discussions anyway. We have the last time I surveyed, over half the students already have like an iPod Touch, and they're bringing them to school. So we're going to have to have those discussions anyway with the students to know what's appropriate, what's not appropriate. Because for some reason, if a teach if a student brings in a picture on their iPod Touch, they think that's a different punishment than if they brought in a picture on a piece of paper. And I'm trying to get them used to there's no difference. They get the same discipline whether it's electronic or paper. And are you guys using uh, for your school counter using the volume purchasing program? Yes. Okay. Which is a pain. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's, it's a pretty convoluted system. So yeah. I order the. I have to order basically gift cards from Apple, and instead of just like emailing me the codes, I have to wait three to five days to get this beautifully packaged credit card looking card in an envelope. I saved the first ones. I mean, it was beautiful. And you type that code in, and then I can buy apps. You can't fault Apple on the packaging, so <laughs> at least. All right, Brian, what about you in terms of rollout? Did you pilot? I, I know you are, I guess, in a sense, piloting with that group, and then you want to talk a little bit about managing these in terms of you know putting the apps yeah. on, on them? Yeah, well, just so you know, what the first thing we did was we bought those test ones. We had the, the XenoThink, which I'm not saying is terrible. It's just it's, it's, it's 10 inches like the iPad, um, but it's a widescreen 10 inches, and it and honestly, it seems a little cumbersome um, to carry around as, as a primary device. We tried that, and then we tried, obviously, um, three different um, ones that we got. Uh, like I said, we ordered more than that, but we didn't necessarily get them all. And I handed them out to teachers over the summer um, to get feedback from them. I had a principal, had them, a, couple, a social studies teacher, a science teacher. So before we actually bought them, I was looking for feedback from teachers to see, hey, do you think you could implement this in your classroom, and do you think this would be effective? So we did test it to a limited extent with teachers before we rolled out to test with students, because really, I would say we're still in our test um, with students. Um, the same thing kind of applies with the way Ryan did it. We have one um, Google account that every single one of these is set up with initially. Um, and if you don't know the way Android device works, you can have multiple Google accounts associated with it. So we've got the, our tablet account set up, and if a student wants to add and then take theirs off, they can, although they don't keep it the whole time. So I don't think many students are, are very um, enthusiastic about doing that. Um, they can add apps. There's no obviously no credit card associated with it, so they can add free apps. Um, in fact, if I went through this, there's a couple games that have been added. Um, that the social studies teacher in question, I think, lets them uh, as a incentive program uh, at the end of class. If they if they're doing so well, they can use them to watch YouTube videos or add apps and play games and stuff. I think. Um, by the way, I, I installed the, the uh, app in there, and I'm getting too much glare here, Ryan, for you to see. <laughs> but uh, I'm looking at a PowerPoint right now, and I can edit it through that. Uh, with Quick Office quite nicely. There's a free 10-day, free, uh, sorry, 7-day trial. The only problem with that is 19 bucks. They had a multiple. That's an expensive app. They had some discount because we, it was, well, they sell a different one for the iPod Touch. It's $5 volume, though, and I think so it was Ryan, is it not? Yeah, so, you sorry, can. Is it not universal then? So you have to buy it for the iPod Touches. Yes. The iPod. Right. Yeah. Oh wow. <laughs> there, yeah. there is. Yeah, there is though uh, a quote fifty or more licenses they do discount. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm gonna have to look at it because it was real easy for me to connect my account to. Um, so it's right now connected to my 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 personal um, Google account, and I was able to bring down a, a PowerPoint really nicely, um, and I can edit it. And so I don't yeah, know I what mean, it does with shared files. If you have a document you've shared with people, I don't know if it keeps the sharing. I don't know if it trashes the sharing. I don't know. I well, that's a good question because this that. actually is not my PowerPoint. It's a shared PowerPoint from somebody else. So I guess I could always see. You know. And I would just like to say that uh, today's podcast <laughs> is brought to you by Quick Office HD. <laughs> oh, it's Quick Office Pro. You yeah. got to buy the Pro because quick, regular Quick Office cannot connect to Dropbox, Google Docs, everything. Quick Office, the regular one, will only let you edit on the device and not connect. Okay. So you have to buy the Pro. So that does work. Um, 
the, as far as the management issue, the, the um, teacher that has the devices has one of these um, uh, one gig sticks that has the, um, uh, the load on it. So basically all he has to do is stick it in the flash drive. You hold down this button. I'm sorry. You stick it in the flash drive there. You hold down this button. When you turn it on, it re-flashes the whole thing, and it's back to our load. And our load has its own logo on the front. This is National Trail uh, School District. It has a little picture on it because with the load, I was able to make our own logo and stuff. So maintaining them is actually pretty easy if there's something he doesn't want. He just reflashes the thing, and it's back to the default. So, that so you, you actually cook your own ROMs for that? Uh, I, I took the default ROM that the manufacturer gave me and just modify. I mean, modifying the – there's basically just an image file on the ROM that you just – can replace it with whatever image file you want. We could go and cook our O's if we wanted to add a bunch of apps to it, although it's not doesn't sound like it's that difficult. But since the social studies teacher says he really doesn't need any apps, I'm, I have I stopped wasting my time doing that. So and, and this might be a good segue into talking a little bit about and, and we've done this, but um, focusing on, you know, how are teachers using this, how are students using this? Do you have any specific apps that you would recommend to others who either have an Android device or an iOS device? Um, and, and maybe a little bit about as we move, I think, more towards a cloud-based environment, do you think that just having a capable browser is going to be enough at some point to do just basic productivity tasks, or do you think you still need all those other apps? Well, oh, one other management that we're going to try with our seventh grade, yeah, because we're buying them all iPod touches. Whether they take them home or not is debatable still. But we are buying them all with a lanyard, and they have to have it around their neck the entire day. They're, and they can't be setting it on anything. Because that was the big concern is if they all have an iPod Touch, they'll leave it on their books, they'll drop it. So we're buying them all a lanyard, and they have to have it hanging around their neck if they want to use it. They can't take it off their neck at all. That's going to is, be the big thing. Is it called the eye bling policy? <laughs> You know, what you need to do is have their student ID be the default background, so they're wearing around, it looks like they're wearing around their student well, ID. Well, that's what I, that's the example, I, we don't have those, but that's the example I said it, because okay. someone said, well, how would we make sure they're wearing that every day? And I'm like, other districts require them to have an ID around their neck. You could so just buy them at a really expensive app, what was it, like a million dollar app, if you remember in the app store, oh, it was just yeah. a picture of a diamond. I am rich. Yeah, that would be perfect, yeah. Um. Now I forgot your question. <laughs> well, just just think about you know, are there any specific apps like for for you, you know the iPod Touches or iPads that you'd recommend to others? You know how are your teachers using it, and then you know, our, we're using it mostly for web-based stuff. Even though I talk about the apps, I know they're using it mostly for web-based stuff because they can do their Google Docs right on it. And we do have Quick Office, but I don't know how much they're using Quick Office versus just using the Google web interface. Uh, they're doing their a lot of the research and stuff on it. Our social studies teacher has downloaded several apps that they use, a Declaration of Independence app, and there's a, several apps with all these historical documents that they've been going through and using it. And those are great. They're free. I think there's a uh, Constitution, Declaration. Yeah. Uh, Brian, what about you? Anything and, besides, and I know I, you mentioned the Kindle. Is I'll there any other apps? I, I would tell you that, that uh, like I said before, it's mainly being used as, with the, through the web interface. They're going to, there's a YouTube app that works really well for them to because he does have a lot of YouTube videos that he has them watch, as I, as do I in my class, and like my eday stuff is all, all based on YouTube videos and and uh, feedback stuff that they're going to do through Moodle lessons online, which just requires a full featured browser. Um, the downside of this device is that because it's running Android 2.3, Google identifies it as a phone. And that's why you can't get to modify your, your PowerPoint mm -hmm. presentation. And it does, does Word documents and it does Excel files just fine, because you can do those on a phone, but it doesn't do. Uh, and, and so I, we keep trying different uh, browsers, but we keep going back to the default is the best choice. Do you know if that will be upgradable to ice cream sandwich? I, I don't know. I'm way, I keep checking to see if there's a ROM already built for it um, and whether it's going to be able to go to the newest version or not. And if it does, obviously that's going to that's gonna solve that issue because then it's not going to be identified as a phone anymore. It's going to be identified as a tablet device, which then hopefully Google will, will let it work. 
because that I mean that's basically the problem. It's not really the browser. It's really Google identifying the browser as as a phone. It doesn't have the little link at the bottom that says switch to desktop view. Yeah, and it doesn't work. Oh, uh, darn it! Yeah, it does. It's take cyanogen mods. Uh, Sometimes you know if you're you know, go back to cooking a ROM or whatever, you might be able to uh, try cyanogen mod. You know what was the name of that device? Though I mean, I know you showed our audience that, but uh, if our audience is listening, what's the name of the device that you're oh. using, Brian? Oh, oh, I just turned off my video. That was oh. it's a that wasn't hot, the button I was shooting for. That's hot it. drop add seven inch capacitive screen S five P V two ten. Well, that just rolls right off the tongue, doesn't yeah, it? It does, I, yeah. Here's the thing that you really want to take from, from everything Ryan said is the name of them changes. You'll see it as Pad, You'll see it as the Wopad. The big thing that I search for is right there, the S5 P. Well, and there's a ton of those on there. And, and I know. If you search <laughs> for that, you're going to see hundreds. And you're going to see the price difference anywhere between you can buy – you know, a hundred of them for four thousand dollars if you're willing to jack out the money, or you can buy um, one of them for two ten. The price is variable between what the distributor, what the size of the RAM is. I would caution, like I said, that even if you look for S five PV two ten, all right, am I getting the resistive or am I getting the capacitive screen? Because, like I said, the one that we got was a good deal that said it was capacitive was not when I got it, and the real reason I sent it back was not the resistive screen. I would have kept it, but the packaging was so bad from that particular distributor that the resistive screen looked like a belt sander had been taken to it by the time I got it. I don't know how you'd be able to type on a resistive screen. I, it, that it's would, not bad. You know, this, this uh, one is, uh, is the, the other one, the uh, um, ZT180, is a resistive screen, and it actually is pretty responsive. Well, the problem is you, have to, you do have to push. So you can't do it while you're walking around holding it in your hand. If I put it on a desk, it types just fine. But the advantage of the other one and, and the iPad and the iTouch is I can be walking around. I just have to make contact with my finger. I don't have to make pressure with my finger, which is where the resistive one fails. And if, if you can, um, Brian, if you can, drop those links into the show notes, that would be great so that, you know, whoever is listening to the podcast, they can, you know, find where that distributor is and the link to the one that you got. Okay. Um, and, we, you know, we've been podcasting, I think, for about five hours now, uh, literally, <laughs> and uh, parts of my body are slowly falling asleep. So uh, what we wanted to I kind of wrap up with is, you know, it sounds like, in your respective districts, it's been very successful, you know, with Android and with iOS. But what are some of the challenges that you faced, uh, you know, not even in terms of rollout, but just, you know, getting people on board, you know, managing these devices, and, and how have you overcome those, if, if there's anything that comes to mind? Well, I would say our first was our Wi-Fi. Um, our, uh, although our district has Wi-Fi coverage, I, I would say it was not strong enough. I ended up bringing everything up to N in the high school and adding a number of access points was, was our first challenge. Uh, not that it was difficult or anything, it's just something that I hadn't really thought about. Now I've got 30 more devices in one confined spot and uh, we have G wireless. So I had, to, I had to upgrade those things to N. As far as getting teachers on board, you know, it, it was easy this time because I, I've been waiting for a teacher to make the request. Um, whether or not we're going to have a problem in the future if we roll out, uh, our, our teaching force is getting more tech savvy. I think every day we do a we do a yearly tech conference um, in our school district. Our marching service is basically a mini uh, e-tech um, with the same kind of of, uh, of sessions as Soida and e-tech Ohio. And I think over the last four years that we've done that, we've brought um, a lot of our less tech, tech savvy teachers up to where I don't think it's going to be as big of a challenge as it would have been prior to that. But I still think we're going to have teachers that um, are going to be hesitant to do it. And, and honestly, if we go a one-to-one -one initiative and go to an electronic textbook, we're going to save the district, I think, $10,000 a year. Uh, and I think I could almost guarantee a $10,000 a year saving, which for our district, when that's over, you know, it's almost half of our textbook cost a year. Um, that we'd be saving, but you have to do it a whole hog. We can't have one teacher not doing it and another teacher doing it. It has to be everybody does it, uh, and we have to make sure it's something that the students can 
get to online because it, obviously this has no 3G. It's got to be Wi-Fi. It's a Wi-Fi only device. So we're going to have to convert everything to Kindle books, um, which we've done before. We've taken paper text that isn't available on Kindle and converted it and turned it into a Kindle book, which is, in my opinion, far superior than a PDF because now they can use the dictionary and they can use the reader um, as opposed to just having a PDF file on there. I, I think a Kindle book is far superior. Uh, are are you guys looking at doing your own textbooks? Because uh, when I look at the what the textbook companies offer, it's you're not going to save any money. Um, I think to some extent we are. If we, ha if we own the paper textbook and we have um, 80 copies and we distribute 80 copies of it electronically provided that's not an available thing, which in every case we've looked at, none of our textbooks are available as Kindle books, um, then fair use says that's fine. If, however, it's it offered as a Kindle book and we convert it to a Kindle book, then we've gone to the year in that gray, mushy area. Even if we own the paper textbook, is that legal for us to do? But because that's not even an issue, not a single one of our textbooks that are paper are Kindle books right now, I think we can convert it quite easily, and we've just gone through and, and done the OCR scanning of, of text uh, and converted it using some free downloaded software, and you turn it into a Kindle book, and it's worked great. Won't the textbook companies come after you for doing that? Not as long as we own a paper copy for every one we use. I mean, that's fair use. If, as long, I mean, if true. we went and I... bought one textbook and did it, well, yeah, then we're doing something illegal, but if we take it, if we... For instance, uh, we already we just bought um, 120 copies of our biology textbook. Well, as long as we don't have over 120 students accessing it and we turn it into Kindle books, we're I still would think they would have, in the license for those, would have said, <laughs> because what's to stop you from replacing books by just photocopying them? Then um, you can. Fair use says we could, as long as we own them, we can just photocopy them. But you the have entire book. And, well, I, I, I mean, fair, I, I, and we're debating fair use versus what the textbook company licensed them to you. Well, they, but I, as long they as I sell you the book, they license it to you. Well, but as long as I own that number of paper copies, I can't make a copy and then distribute. You know, I can't own one. Right, right. I understand said. where you're coming from. But, I'm surprised that they don't haven't closed that loophole because they'd rather you buy a replacement copy from them, not just copy one of your own. That's a good question. Actually, yeah, Brian, I got a, uh, well, I, just a response there. Uh, that's why I buy all my textbooks uh, from a guy uh, in a van down by the river. So that, <laughs> that eliminates any question there. Uh, well, I mean, fairly you, certain you, I, I'm sure we'll get that issue that, that will come up as schools look at doing this if they own the paper copies. But I never thought uh, of doing that. That's, you you I, own that textbook, and you own that many copies. And that's what, I mean, that's what we did with our, our English. Um, we bought Kindle books if the Kindle books were available. But in some cases, the Kindle books weren't available. And the only option for them to not change books was to go and OCR scan them, turn it into a Kindle book, and toss it on the Kindle. And that's what we did. And they worked great. So, I just right. have one, one question before you, you back up there. You talked about um, you know professional development for your staff, Brian. Did you make that mandatory for all staff, or is that voluntary? Yeah, oh, it's, it is our um, March in-service day. Um, so I run the entire March in service uh, with the technology steering committee, and um, everyone who goes to eTech, and usually we take eight teachers every year, um, or myself and seven more, everyone has to teach two sessions at that, and then we usually have an, a, a, a pretty good core group of tech savvy teachers that are willing to teach one other class, and usually we end up with 40 different, se 40 different sessions. 10 at a time running four different sessions. We started doing three this past year to give more hands-on time. Our, our theme last year was uh, learn less, do more, uh, where the teachers only were allowed to teach for 30 minutes, and then there had to be 50 minutes of hands-on using whatever they learned because the, our feedback had been, I learned great stuff, but I forget it by next year. <laughs> So we started changing the format of it to more hands-on. All of them are in labs. and So, yeah, everybody goes to them and lets they call in sick. Uh, but it's a regular school day that everybody has to go to. And then we also do Tech Tuesdays after school. And I have uh, our website um, where all of our, um, basically every class that we have usually is taught also as a, um, or is recorded and, and uh, 
shared on our website, this website that I just brought up is our edtechteach.com, which is open for anybody. It's not closed to just our district, and then that's where we keep like our E-Day training that we just did and, and different Moodle courses and different staff PD courses. I try to videotape anything that we do so that um, teachers later on can go and see it at their own pace and review stuff there, too. I believe Eric Kurtz is uh, doing something like that, too. No? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> All right, Ryan, any, any words of wisdom or thoughts on, on your experience with tablets and, and uh, trials and tribulations? <laughs> Where do I start? No, um, I think the hardest thing is to get the teachers in the mindset that you can use these as tools and they're not just toys. Um, the students will... I've learned that the students will do the most mundane task if it involves something electronic. And, but the teachers, they kind of get hung up on too much of the classroom management point and don't see the forest for the trees that, oh, I can be doing this stuff then without, and they always, they concentrate on just the minute stuff. I get hung up, I always concentrate on the tech stuff and I can sort of understand where they're coming from. But I, what I tell them is, in five years, everything's going to be handheld, and we're not going to be buying desktop computers anymore. And they don't believe me. They also don't believe me when I said, yeah, that smart board, that thing's 20, that, that's a 20-year-old technology. And they're like, oh, what? <laughs> yes, it's been out for 20 years. So they don't believe me, but I'll hold it over their heads in 2016, 2017. <laughs> All right, and Eric Kurtz, I think you wanted to share some interesting data before we wrap up from the beta survey on tablets. Um, uh, I was just taking a look at a few, oh, there we go, am I there? Hey, I'm there, all right, sorry about that, guys. I was just taking a look at a couple of quick stats um, while you guys were talking, fantastic, thanks for sharing all that you did, but just to kind of put some things in perspective, um, recently, uh, schools in Ohio took the beta survey, uh, that would have been in the spring, and you can go on to eTech's site to take a look at, at the beta results. I haven't had a chance to dive into them a whole lot yet, but one thing I was looking at while we were chatting today was, okay, well, how much are tablets being used? You know, this is a, a, a really important discussion, but where are most schools going to be? You know, as schools are listening to you, you know, here I am at North Can. Uh, seriously, we may have six iPads in the entire district, you know, and they're just some test ones that we're using with special ed. Um, and, and it's real exciting. There's a lot of promise there, but where are most people at? So what I did was I took a look at the beta, and my numbers won't be perfect here, but if you take a look at the state of Ohio, we have about 89,000 teachers. So I'm going to use that number to say we have about 89,000 classrooms. I mean, that's not exactly right, but I'm going to use that to kind of help with this because if I go down further into the data, you see tablets come up as a question saying, are you using these? Now, this is very misleading. You see 80% and you think 80% of the schools are using them. No, no, no. That just means 80% of the respondents of these four options here chose classrooms versus labs versus this versus that. The number you want to look at is here, 8,025 classrooms in Ohio said that they are currently using tablet computers in the classroom. So if there's 8,000 classrooms using it and there's 89,000 teachers, it's somewhere around one out of every 11 classrooms are using tablets in some form. So we're really, really, really early on into this. This is, you know, something that is you know, going to change dramatically over the years to come. So I could see definitely this being a topic that comes back on the state of tech sometime in the future when we, you know, revisit this because, you know, schools that are listening right now, if I want to take that statistic, kind of like, you know, 90% of them, they're not doing this right now. You know, they're just listening to what you guys have to say and going, you know, how, how might we start dipping our toe in the pool here? So, you know, this I, I hope has served people as a good introduction to just the idea of what, um, you know, you, what tablets or what options are out there, uh, what are some of the challenges, what are some of the cool things you guys have been doing with it. Um, but I think we've all got a long way to go before this really becomes something that is getting used a lot in schools. But we appreciate so much you blazing that trail as the 9% uh, or so that, that, that you guys are doing that for us. 
All right, I really want to thank Brian Poole and Ryan Collins for joining us today. You guys were fantastic. Um, had a lot of great stuff to share, and I'm sure hopefully our listeners will get a lot out of the podcast. All right, so upcoming episodes on November 19th, we're going to be talking about creative tech support, so some alternative types of tech support than just your traditional. On December 6th, we'll be live at the Sweta Conference talking about our favorite gadgets. I think we're all going to bring some gadgets to the podcast and interview Leslie Fisher, who's going to be there. And on December 17th, we're going to try uh, to focus on an actual, just a specific subject this time, and that's going to be technology and, math and mathematics best practices. So we're going to try something new, and hopefully everybody will tune into that. And uh, Eric C. is going to share some listener feedback with you. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, again, we just really want to say it is we really appreciate so much folks who do interact with us through uh, you know the blog through um, iTunes comments through um, uh, just email you know whatever the case uh, through through Twitter posts all these sort of things and also our um, our surveys we put out a survey about a month before every podcast to say here's the upcoming topic and tell us you know what what you know about it and, and that really helps a lot because the responses we get through those surveys help us find people uh, some of our guests have been on because they filled out the survey it also helps us see uh, how people are using these around Ohio so that we can can illustrate some of the best practices um, and helps us realize some questions to ask things that we may not be aware of so um, it, it's really just critical and we really appreciate so much uh, the, the, the folks who are listening getting involved as well and we do have some listener feedback to, to share I uh, just wanted to hit these real quick um, Nick Ryder uh, posted on our site he said very cool I am glad to be aware of this resource you guys are truly dedicated educational technology geeks that take it to the next level Thanks, Nick. Uh, Kelly McMahon said, thanks, really made me think about a BYOT program. So in reference to our last episode, I took a lot of notes, she says. And then Karen Stotts says, um, I love your site. Thank you so much for sharing your wealth of knowledge. But again, I want to thank those folks for taking the time to share that and thank everybody else who's filled out our surveys, who's listened. And because really that's the whole point. We're just trying to uh, connect people around Ohio and the surrounding area and show some of the best practices that are happening and uh, help people to start considering some of these technology issues. So um, I will now throw this over to Eric G, and hopefully his voice has uh, rested a, a little bit during the podcast, and he's feeling better as he wraps things up for us. Eric? Just a little bit, yes, hopefully. Thank you. Um, I also wanted to say I, I went to our WOCO uh, tech coordinators meeting yesterday, and uh, that too um, got a lot of great uh, feedback from uh, listeners, uh, except Sean. No one really, really likes Sean. So... Uh, we're going to talk to Sean a little later about that, but uh, I would like to thank all of our listeners uh, for watching and listening to the State of Tech. And as always, there are three different ways you can get in contact with us. Uh, one is our phone number, 513-318-TECH. Uh, That's a Google Voice number. Uh, you can do Twitter. It's at the State of Tech. Or you can do us uh, email. Contact us via email. It is thestateoftech at gmail.com. So like Eric and Sean said, you know, don't forget to post comments on our blogs and everything else. Um, rate us on uh, tw not Twitter. Rate us on iTunes. Uh, I'd love to see just a few stars go up there so we can top some of the other podcasts through there. And lastly, um, thank you for watching. And this has been the State of Tech. We'll see you in another two weeks for another State of Tech.